basis of Palestinian life in Gaza. Second, together with the forced displacement, Israel's conduct has been deliberately calculated to cause widespread hunger, dehydration, and starvation. Israel's campaign has pushed Gazans to the brink of famine. An unprecedented 93% of the population in Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger. Of all the people in the world currently suffering catastrophic hunger, more than 80% are in Gaza. The situation is such that the experts are now predicting that more Palestinians in Gaza may die from starvation and disease than airstrikes. And yet Israel continues to impede the effective delivery of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians, not only refusing to allow sufficient aid in, but removing the ability to distribute it through constant bombardment and obstruction. Just three days ago, on 8 January, a planned mission by UN agencies to deliver urgent medical supplies and vital fuel to a hospital and medical supply center was, was denied by Israeli authorities. This marked the fifth denial of a mission to the center since 26 December, leaving five hospitals in northern Gaza without access to life-saving medical supplies and equipment. Aid trucks that are allowed in are seized upon by the hungry. What is provided is simply not enough. <laughs> Madam President, members of the court, this is an image of an aid truck arriving in Gaza. Third, Israel has deliberately inflicted conditions in which Palestinians in Gaza are denied adequate shelter, clothes, or sanitation. For weeks, there have been acute shortages of clothes, bedding, blankets, and critical non-food items. Clean water is all but gone leaving far below the amount required to safely drink, clean, and cook. Accordingly, the WHO has stated that Gaza is experiencing soaring rates of infectious disease outbreaks. Cases of diarrhea in children under five years of age have increased 2,000% since hostilities began. When combined and left untreated, malnutrition and disease create a deadly cycle. The fourth genocidal act under Article 2B is Israel's military assault on Gaza's healthcare system, which renders life unsustainable. Even by 7 December, the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to health noted that the health care of infrastructure in the Gaza Strip has been completely obliterated. Those wounded by Israel in Gaza are being deprived of life-saving medical care. Gaza's health care system, already crippled by years of blockade and prior attacks by Israel, is unable to cope with the sheer scale of the injuries. Finally, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls has pointed to acts committed by Israel that would fall under the, cat under the fourth category of genocidal acts in Article 2D of the Convention. On 22 November, she expressly warned the following. The, rep the reproductive violence inflicted by Israel on Palestinian women, newborn babies, infants, and children 
could be qualified as acts of genocide under Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, including imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group. Israel is blocking the delivery of life-saving aid, including essential medical kits for delivering babies in circumstances where an estimated 180 women are giving birth in Gaza each day. Of these 180 women, the WHO warns that 15% are likely to experience pregnancy or birth-related complications and need additional medical care. That care is simply not available. In some, Madam President, all of these acts, individually and collectively, form a calculated pattern of conduct by Israel, indicating a genocidal intent. This intent is evident from Israel's conduct in specially targeting Palestinians living in Gaza, using weaponry that causes large-scale homicidal destruction, as well as targeting, sni targeted sniping of civilians, designating safe zones for Palestinians to seek refuge, and then bombing these, depriving Palestinians in Gaza of basic needs, food, water, healthcare, fuel, sanitation, and communications, destroying social infrastructure, homes, schools, mosques, churches, hospitals, and killing, seriously injuring, and leaving large numbers of children orphaned. Genocides are never declared in advance. But this court has the benefit of the past 13 weeks of evidence that shows incontrovertibly a pattern of conduct and related intention that justifies a plausible claim of genocidal acts. In the Gambia Myanmar case, this court did not hesitate to impose provisional measures in relation to allegations that Myanmar was committing genocidal acts against the Rohingya within the Rakhine state. The facts before the court today are sadly even more stark and like the Gambia Myanmar case, deserve and demand this court's intervention. Every day, there is mounting irreparable loss of life, property, dignity, and humanity for the Palestinian people. Our news feeds show graphic images of suffering that has become unbearable to watch. Nothing will stop the suffering except an order from this court. Without an indication of provisional measures, the atrocities will continue with the Israeli Defense Force indicating that it intends pursuing this course of action for at least a year. In the words of the UN Under Secretary General on 5 January 2024, I quote, you think getting aid into Gaza is easy? Think again. Three layers of inspections before trucks can even enter. Confusion and long queues, a growing list of rejected items, a crossing point meant for pedestrians, not trucks, another crossing point where trucks have been blocked by desperate, hungry communities, a destroyed commercial sector, constant bombardments, poor communications, damaged roads, convoys shot at, damaged delays at checkpoints, a traumatized and exhausted population crammed into a smaller and smaller sliver of land, 
shelters which have long exceeded their full capacity, aid workers themselves displaced, killed. This is an impossible situation for the people of Gaza and for those trying to help them. The fighting must stop. Close quote. Madam President, members of the court, that concludes my section on the genocidal conduct of Israel. I thank you for your patient attention, and I ask that you call Advocate Mukai Tobi to the podium to address the court on genocidal intent. I thank Ms. Hassim, and I now invite Mr. Tembeke Nuka Tobi to address the court. You have the floor, sir. Madam President and distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before the court on behalf of South Africa. I will address Israel's genocidal intent. At this stage, the court is not required to determine that the only inference to be drawn from the available evidence is genocide to order provisional measures, as that is to decide the merits. Rather, the assessment of the existence of an intent to destroy could be made by the court only at the stage of the examination of the merits. That some of the alleged acts may also amount to atrocities other than genocide does not exclude the finding of plausible acts of genocide. Madam President, South Africa is not alone in drawing attention to Israel's genocidal rhetoric against Palestinians in Gaza. 15 United Nations Special Rapporteurs and 21 members of the United Nations Working Groups have warned that what is happening in Gaza reflects a genocide in the making and an overt intent to destroy the Palestinian people under occupation. Israel has a genocidal intent against the Palestinians in Gaza. That is evident from the way in which Israel's military attack is being conducted, which has been described by Ms. Hassim S.C. It is systematic in its character and form the mass displacement of the population of Gaza, headed into areas where they continue to be killed, and the deliberate creation of conditions that, quote, lead to a slow death, unquote. There is also the clear pattern of conduct, the targeting of family homes and civilian infrastructure, laying waste to vast areas of Gaza, and the bombing, shelling and sniping of men, women and children where they stand, the destruction of the health infrastructure and lack of access to humanitarian assistance. So much so that as we stand today, 1% of the pa Palestinian population in Gaza has been systematically decimated. And one in four Gazans have been injured since 7 October. These two elements alone are capable of evidencing Israel's genocidal intent in relation to the whole or part of the Palestinian population in Gaza. However, third, there is an extraordinary feature in this case that Israel's political leaders military commanders and persons holding official positions have systematically and in explicit terms declared their genocidal intent. And these statements are then repeated by soldiers on the ground in Gaza as they engage in the destruction of Palestinians and the physical infrastructure of Gaza. We show this third element next. Israel's special genocidal intent is rooted in the belief 
that in fact the enemy is not just the military wing of Hamas or indeed Hamas generally, but is embedded in the fabric of Palestinian life in Gaza. On 7 October, in a televised address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared war on Gaza, and I quote, Israel had started clearing out the communities that have been infiltrated by terrorists. And he warned of an unprecedented price to be paid by the enemy. There are more than 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza. Israel is the occupying power in control of Gaza. It controls entry, exit, and the internal movements of inside Gaza. And qua Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu exercises overall command over the Israeli Defense Force and in turn, the Palestinians in Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu in his address to the Israeli forces on 28 October 2023, preparing for the invasion of Gaza, urged the soldiers to remember what Amalek has done to you. This refers to the biblical command by God to Saul for the retaliatory destruction of an entire group of people known as the Amalekites, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. The genocidal invocation to Amalek was anything but idle. It was repeated by Mr. Netanyahu in a letter to the Israeli Armed Forces on 3 November 2023. Madam President, let the Prime Minister's words speak for themselves. has done to you, says our Holy Bible, and we do remember and we are fighting our brave troops and combatants who are now in Gaza or around Gaza. And in The Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, has called for the erasure of the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. The Defense Force agrees. On 9 October, the Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, gave a situation update to the army, where he said that as Israel was imposing a complete siege on Gaza, there would be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything would be closed because Israel is fighting human animals. <coughs> Speaking to troops on the Gaza border, he instructed them that he has released all the restraints and that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. We will reach all places. Eliminate everything, reach all places without any restraints. The theme of destruction of human animals was reiterated by an Israeli army coordinator of government activities in the territories on 9 October 2023, who in an address to Hamas and the residents of Gaza stated that Hamas has become ISIS and that the citizens of Gaza are celebrating instead of being horrified. He concluded that human animals are dealt with accordingly. Israel has imposed a total blockade on Gaza. No electricity, no water, just damage. You wanted hell, you will get hell. The language of systematic dehumanization is evident here. Human animals. Both Hamas and civilians are condemned. Within the Israeli cabinet, this is also a widely held view. The Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, Israel Katz, called for the denial of water and fuel, as this is what will happen to a people of children killers and slaughterers. 
This admits of no ambiguity. It means to create conditions of death of the Palestinian people in Gaza. To die a slow death because of starvation and dehydration, or to die quickly because of a bomb attack or snipers, but to die nevertheless. In fact, Heritage Minister Amichai Eliyahu said that Israel must find ways for Gazans that are more painful than death. It is no answer to say that neither are in command of the army. They are ministers in the Israeli government. They vote in the Knesset and are in a position to shape state policy. The intent to destroy Gaza has been nurtured at the highest levels of state. As President Isaac Herzog has joined the ranks of those signing bombs destined for Gaza. Having previously noted that the entire population in Gaza is responsible and that this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved is absolutely not true. We will fight until we break their backbone. Later attempts by the president and others to neutralize this speech have not altered the sting of his words which was to tar all Palestinians as responsible for the actions of Hamas. No, as I will show below, has it affected how state policy is understood within government. The Minister of National Security repeated the President's statements that Hamas and civilians are responsible in equal measure. On 10 November 2023, in a televised interview, he stated that when we say that Hamas should be destroyed, it also means those who celebrate, those who support, and those who hand out candy. They are all terrorists, and they should also be destroyed. These are orders to destroy and to maim what cannot be destroyed. These statements are not open to neutral interpretations or after the fact rationalizations and reinterpretations by Israel. The statements were made by persons in command of the state. They communicated state policy. It is simple. If the statements were not intended, they would not have been made. The genocidal intent behind these statements is not ambiguous to the Israeli soldiers on the ground. Indeed, it is directing their actions and objectives. On 7 December 2023, Israeli soldiers proved that they understood the Prime Minister's message to remember what the Amalek has done to you as genocidal. They were recorded by journalists dancing and singing. We know our motto, there are no uninvolved, that they obey one commandment to wipe off the seed of Amalek. The Prime Minister's invocation of Amalek is being used by soldiers to justify the killing of civilians, including children. These are the soldiers repeating the inciting words of their Prime Minister. soldiers in Gaza were filmed dancing, chanting, and singing in November. May their village burn, may Gaza be erased. There is now a trend among the soldiers to film themselves committing atrocities against civilians in Gaza in a form of snuff video. One recorded himself detonating over 50 houses in Shujaiya. 
other soldiers were recorded singing, we will destroy all of Khan Yunus and this house. We will blow it up for you and for everything you do for us. These are the soldiers putting into effect their command. The commanders of the army are also of the same mind. Israeli army commander Yair Ben David has stated that the army had done in Beit Hanon and did there as Shimon and Levi did in Nablus, and that the entire Gaza should resemble Beit Hanon. Israeli soldier Yeshayi Shalev published a video against the backdrop of the ruins of what was the site of Al-Azhar University with the caption, once upon a time, there was a university in Gaza and in practice, a school for murderers and human animals. Soldiers obviously believe that this language and their actions are acceptable because the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza is articulated state policy. Senior political and military officials encouraged without censure the 95-year-old Israeli army reservist Ezra Yachin, a veteran of the Deir Yassin massacre against the Palestinians in 1948, to speak to the soldiers ahead of the ground invasion in Gaza. In his tour, he echoed the same sentiment while being driven around in an officially Israeli army vehicle dressed in Israeli army fatigue, I quote, be triumphant and finish them off and don't leave anyone behind. Erase the memory of them, erase them, their families, mothers and children. These animals can no longer live. If you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait, go to his home and shoot him. We want to invade, not like before. We want to enter and destroy what's in front of us and destroy houses, then destroy the one after it. With all of our forces, complete destruction, enter and destroy. As you can see, we will witness things we've never dreamed of. Let, the, let them drop bombs on them and erase them. As recently as 7 January 2024, a video of a soldier was posted online where he boasts that the army had destroyed the entire village of Hibat Azar. For two weeks, he said, they had worked hard to bomb the village and executed their mandate. Any suggestion that senior politicians did not mean what they said, much less that the meaning was not understood by soldiers in Gaza, would be without any merit. The scale of destruction in Gaza, the mass targeting of family homes and civilians, the war being a war on children, all make clear that genocidal intent is both understood and is being put into practice. The articulated intent is the destruction of Palestinian life in all its manifestations. The genocidal rhetoric is also commonplace within the Israeli Knesset. Members of the Knesset have repeatedly called for Gaza to be wiped out, flattened, erased, and crushed on all its inhabitants. They have deplored anyone feeling sorry for the uninvolved Gazans, asserting repeatedly that there are no uninvolved that there are no innocents in Gaza, 
that the killers of the women and children should not be separated from the citizens of Gaza, and that the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves, and that there should be one sentence for everyone there, death. Finally, the lawmakers have called for mercilessly bombing from the air, with some advocating for the use of nuclear doomsday weapons, and a Nakba that will overshadow the Nakba of 48. The Prime Minister's genocidal speech has gained ground among some elements of civil society. A famous singer has repeated Mr. Netanyahu's Amalek reference, stating that Gaza must be wiped out and be destroyed with every Amalek seed. We simply must destroy all of Gaza and exterminate everyone who is there. Another has called to erase Gaza, not leave a single person there. Journalists and commentators have announced that the woman is an enemy, the baby is an enemy, the pregnant woman is an enemy. That it is necessary to turn the strip into a slaughterhouse, to demolish every house our soldiers come across, exterminate everyone. The intentional failure of the government of Israel to condemn, prevent, and punish such genocidal incitement constitutes in itself a grave violation of the Genocide Convention. We should recall, Madam President, that in Article 1 of the Convention, Israel confirmed that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law. And it undertook to prevent and to punish it as such. This failure to prevent, condemn, and punish such speech by the government has served to normalize genocidal rhetoric and extreme danger for Palestinians within Israeli society. As M.K. Moshe Sada from the Likud party has said, the government's own attorneys share his views that Palestinians in Gaza must be destroyed. I quote, you go anywhere and they tell you to destroy them. In the kibbutz, they tell you to destroy them. My friends at the state attorney's office who fought with me on political issues in debate said to me, it is clear that we need to destroy all Gazans. Destroy all Gazans. Israel is aware of its destruction of Palestinian life and infrastructure. Despite this knowledge, it has maintained and indeed intensified its military activity in Gaza. As to full awareness, in the week after 7 October, NGOs and the United Nations warned of an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The UN stated that actors must allow humanitarian teams and goods to immediately and safely reach the hundreds of thousands of people in need. So right from the beginning, Israel knew that it was depriving water, food, electricity, and essentials for survival. It said so. Everything is closed. It has known that it was depriving Palestinians of health care and treatment for injury in the middle of an unprecedented bombardment of food and water and of other essentials for survival. This prompted the World Health Organization to say, we are on our knees asking for sustained, scaled up, protected humanitarian operations, appealing to all those in a situation to make a decision or influence decision makers to give us the humanitarian space to address this human catastrophe. Despite this knowledge, Israel continues to target infrastructure essential for survival. Water and sanitation infrastructure, solar panels, bakeries, mills, crops. It bombs hospitals, decimating the healthcare system. It targets aid workers and the infrastructure of the United Nations. It is because of the policy of Israel that Gaza has become a place of death and despair. 
In conclusion, Madam President, many propagators of grave atrocities have protested that they were misunderstood, <coughs> that they did not mean what they said, and that their own words were taken out of context. What state would admit to a genocidal intent? Yet, the distinctive feature of this case has not been the silence as such, but the reiteration and repetition of genocidal speech throughout every sphere of state in Israel. We remind the court of the identity and authority of the genocidal inciters. The Prime Minister, the President, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, members of the Knesset, senior army officials, and foot soldiers. Genocidal utterances are therefore not out in the fringes. They are embodied in state policy. The intent to destroy is plainly understood by soldiers on the ground. It is also fully understood by some within the Israeli society, with the government facing criticism for allowing in any aid to Gaza on the basis that it is recanting on its promise to starve Palestinians. Any suggestion that Israeli officials did not mean what they said or were not fully understood by soldiers and civilians alike to mean what they said should be rejected by this court. The evidence of genocidal intent is not only chilling, it is also overwhelming and incontrovertible. Madam President, it is now my honor to request you to call Mr. John Dugat on the subject of jurisdiction. I thank Mr. Gutkai Toby, and I now invite Professor John Dugart to take the floor. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a great privilege to appear before you today on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. In my speech, I will address the question of jurisdiction. The people of South Africa and of Israel both have a history of suffering. Both states have become parties to the Genocide Convention in the determination to end suffering. In this spirit, neither has attached a reservation to Article 9 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It is in terms of this Convention dedicated to saving humanity that South Africa brings this dispute before the court. <coughs> the prohibition on genocide is a peremptory norm. Obligations under the Genocide Convention are ergo omnes, obligations owed to the international community as a whole. States parties to this convention are obliged not only to desist from genocidal acts, but also to prevent them. That the obligation of state parties to prevent acts of genocide is the foundation of the convention is clear from its placement in Article 1 of the Convention. <laughs> Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes it clear that state parties are guardians of the Genocide Convention. Unlike other treaties designed to protect human rights, it does not oblige states to pursue negotiations as a prelude to approaching this court. It does not treat the ending of genocidal acts as a bilateral affair between states. Instead, it envisages a situation in which a state, acting on behalf of the international community as a whole, seizes the jurisdiction of the court as a matter of urgency to prevent genocide. 
South Africa has a long history of close relations with Israel. For this reason, it did not bring the dispute immediately to the attention of the court. It watched with horror as Israel responded to the terrible atrocities committed against its people on 7 of October, with an attack on Gaza that resulted in the indiscriminate killing of innocent Palestinian civilians, most of whom were women and children. The South African government repeatedly voiced its concerns in the Security Council and in public statements that Israel's actions had become genocidal. On 10 November, in a formal diplomatic day march, it informed Israel that while it condemned the actions of Hamas, it wanted the International Criminal Court to investigate the leadership of Israel for international crimes, including genocide. As the court will know, the definition of genocide in the Rome Statute repeats that of the Genocide Convention. On 17 October, South Africa referred Israel's Commission of the Crime of Genocide to the International Criminal Court for, quote, vigorous investigation, unquote. In announcing this decision, President Ramaphosa publicly expressed his abhorrence for what is happening right now in Gaza, which is now turned into a concentration camp where genocide is taking place. To accuse a state of committing acts of genocide and to condemn it in such strong language is a major act on the part of a state. At this stage, it became clear that there was a serious dispute between South Africa and Israel, which would end only with the end of Israel's genocidal act. South Africa repeated this accusation at a meeting of BRICS on 21 November, and at an emergency special session of the United Nations General Assembly on 12 December. No response from Israel was forthcoming. None was necessary. By this time, the dispute had crystallized as a matter of law. This was confirmed by Israel's official and unequivocal denial on 6 December that it was committing genocide in Gaza. However, as a matter of courtesy, before filing the present application, on 21 December, South Africa sent a note per ball to the Embassy of Israel to reiterate its view that Israel's acts of genocide in Gaza amounted to genocide, that it as a state party to the Genocide Convention was under an obligation to prevent genocide from being committed. Israel responded by way of a note for Mal that failed to address the issues raised by South Africa in its note and neither affirmed nor denied the existence of a dispute. <coughs> this was emailed later on the 27th of December. This note was received by the relevant South African team on the 29th of December after the present application was filed. On 4 January, South Africa replied to this note Babal, highlighting Israel's failure to prevent any response to the matters raised by South Africa over the previous months, as reiterated in its note Babal. South Africa made it clear that given Israel's ongoing conduct against Palestinians in Gaza, the dispute re referred to in its note Babal of 21 December remained unresolved and was plainly not capable of resolution by way of a bilateral meeting. Nevertheless, South Africa proposed a meeting on 5 January, again out of courtesy. Israel responded to this note, Babal, by proposing that we reconnect to coordinate a meeting at the earliest opportunity after the close of hearings in the present case. 
To this, South Africa understandably replied that such a meeting would serve no purpose. Madam President, these notes verbal are all to be found in the judge's folder. The existence of a dispute is a matter to be determined by an objective determination of the fact as they existed at the time of the filing of the application. At this time, South Africa had already accused Israel in the Security Council, the General Assembly, and other public fora of engaging in genocidal acts. It had conducted a diplomatic day march on Israel, warning it that it viewed its conduct as genocidal. It had requested the International Criminal Court to vigorously investigate crimes under the Genocide Convention committed by Israel in the Gaza Strip, and it accused Israel into alia of the deliberate targeting of civilians, intentionally causing starvation and impeding relief supplies. It had accused Israel leaders of expressing, quote, the intent of committing genocide. Israel had flatly denied South Africa's accusations. <coughs> Despite these harsh accusations, Israel has persisted in its genocidal act against the population of Gaza. What more evidence could be required to it? It is precisely because of a situation of this kind affecting the international community as a whole, that Article 9 of the Genocide Convention does not require negotiations as a precondition to seizing the jurisdiction of the court. Certainly, a respondent state cannot prevent a referral to the court by claiming that there is no dispute and that it wants discussions on this matter when the existence of the dispute is clear. For a state to insist on a time frame for negotiations would simply be a license to commit genocide and would run counter to the object and purpose of the Geneva, of the Genocide Convention. Madam President, the question of the crystallization of a dispute has been addressed by this court in preliminary objections at the merit stage where the burden of proof is higher. Although the court has generally adopted a flexible approach to the subject, it has laid down a number of tests for the existence of a dispute. First, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. Second, the date for determining the existence of the dispute is the date of the application, but subsequent conduct may be considered. Three, whether the dispute exists must be determined by an objective determination of the facts. And four, a dispute exists when it is demonstrated on the basis of the evidence that the respondent was aware or could not have been unaware that its views were positively opposed. When these propositions are applied to the facts of this case, it is incontrovertible that a dispute exists between South Africa and Israel. South Africa strongly believes that what Israel is doing in Gaza amounts to genocide. Israel denies this and claims that such an accusation is legally and factually wrong and, moreover, <coughs> is obscene. So an objective determination of the facts shows that a dispute existed on the date of the submission of South Africa's application, and this has been confirmed by Israel's subsequent statements and by its continuing conduct in Gaza. Moreover, Israel must have been aware from South Africa's public statements, the demarche, and the referral 
of the matter to the International Criminal Court of Israel's genocidal act that a dispute existed between the two states. Madam President, the court has indicated that in an application for provisional measures, it is sufficient to show that there is a prima facie basis for jurisdiction. It is submitted that South Africa has convincingly established the existence of a dispute between it and Israel over the fulfillment of the latter's obligations under the Genocide Convention. Finally, it is submitted that regard should be had to the special considerations that apply to the existence of a dispute under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention between a state that brings an application in furtherance of its obligation to prevent genocide and a state accused of committing genocide. This, this concludes my speech. Madam President, I thank you, the members of the court, for your attention. I now ask you to call to the podium Professor Max to proceed to address you on the nature of the rights requiring protection and the link between such rights and the, and the measures requested. Thank you. I thank you, Professor Dugard. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, the court will observe a coffee break of 10 minutes. Sitting is adjourned.
Please be seated. The sitting is resumed. I now give the floor to Professor Max Duplessis. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before you. It's truly my honor to represent South Africa in these proceedings. I will be focusing on the nature of the rights that South Africa seeks to preserve through its application and the link between such rights and the measures requested. As well established in the court's jurisprudence and most recently in this court's decision in the Gambia case, for the court to exercise its power to indicate provisional measures, the rights claimed by South Africa on the merits and for which it is seeking protection must be at least plausible. This threshold does not require the court to determine definitively whether the rights which South Africa wishes to see protected exist. Rather, the rights asserted must merely be grounded in a possible interpretation of the convention, and the court must be concerned to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. Palestinians in Gaza, as a very substantial and important part of the Palestinian national, racial, and ethnical group, simply but profoundly are entitled to exist. As South Africa's ambassador pointed out in opening, to situate the right to exist and the threats to that right requires the court to appreciate that this application by South Africa is brought within a particular context. What is happening in Gaza now is not correctly framed as a simple conflict between two parties. It entails instead destructive acts perpetrated by an occupying power, Israel, that has subjected the Palestinian people to an oppressive and prolonged violation of their rights to self-determination for more than half a century. And those violations occur in a world where Israel for years has regarded itself as beyond and above the law. As the UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories explained in 2022, and I quote, the occupation by Israel has been conducted in profound defiance of international law and hundreds of United Nations resolutions with scant pushback from the international community. That context is important, as South Africa made clear in its application. Where the international community has failed Palestinians for so long, and despite Israel's willful defiance of Palestinians' rights, South Africa turns to this court seeking to protect the core rights of Palestinians in Gaza to be protected from acts of genocide, attempted genocide, direct and public incitement to genocide, and complicity in and conspiracy to commit genocide. As the court knows, the convention prohibits the destruction of a group or part of that group, including through killing, causing serious bodily and mental harm, and inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the group's physical destruction. Through these core rights, the Convention further protects the rights of its members to life and physical and mental integrity. Palestinians in Gaza, women, men, children, because of their membership in a group, are protected by the Convention, as is the group itself. And the core rights are violated and threatened by a remarkable set of facts outlined by my colleagues and set out in detail in South Africa's application with supporting evidence. In the speeches to this court today, South Africa has chosen, as you've heard, to avoid the showing of graphic videos and photos. It has decided against turning this court into a theater for spectacle. It knows, as well as your excellencies, the temptation for both sides in a dispute to parade pictures to shock. But South Africa's application in this court today is built on a foundation of clear legal rights, not images. The detailed material before the court is marshaled 
to show a case for provisional measures based firmly on this court's prior decisions, and South Africa advances its case on the basis that Palestinians' rights are equally as worthy of protection on the unprecedented evidence before you as those of the victim groups that this honorable court has previously protected by its issuance of provisional measures in the past. <clears throat> the material confirms the rights in issue and their violation that Israel has committed and is committing acts capable of being characterized as genocidal. You have heard from Ms. Hassim about direct extermination of thousands of people and children of the Palestinian population in Gaza since 7 October last year. And South Africa and the world together stand witness to the forced evacuation of over 85% of the population of Gaza from their homes and the herding of them into ever smaller areas without adequate shelter or medical care to be attacked, killed and harmed. So, the rights are immediately and urgently in need of protection because of the ongoing denial by Israel of the conditions necessary for life. It is difficult, with respect, to think of a clearer or more abundantly urgent case. Arif Hussain, the chief economist at the United Nations World Food Programme, chillingly warned a week ago on the 3rd of January, and I quote, I've been doing this, he said, for the past two decades, and I've been to all kinds of conflicts and all kinds of crises. And for me, this, the situation in Gaza, is unprecedented because of one, the magnitude, the scale, the entire population of a particular place. Second, the severity. And third, the speed at which this is happening at which this has unfolded is unprecedented. He concluded, in my life, I've never seen anything like this in terms of severity, in terms of scale, and then in terms of speed. Madam President, esteemed judges, the core rights on the evidence provided by South Africa in its application are demonstrably being violated. Multiple further statements by UN bodies and experts, as well as various expert human rights organizations and institutions and states, all of which is set out in South Africa's application, confirm as much. They collectively have considered the acts committed by Israel to be genocidal, or at the very least warned that the Palestinian people are at risk of genocide. Since the application was initiated, further states, 13 to date, including the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, representing 57 states, as well as other experts, have expressed their support for the case, thereby underlining the plausibility of South Africa's claim for provisional measures. For the purposes of the indication of provisional measures, the rights asserted by South Africa under the Genocide Convention and their protection corresponds with the very object and purpose of the Convention. Based on the materials before the court, the acts by Israel complained of are capable of being characterized as at least plausibly genocidal. As Mr. Nkonkai Tobi has explicated, the evidence of the specific genocidal intent is clear from the statements by Israeli government officials and soldiers towards Palestinians in Gaza and which may be characterized as at the very least plausibly genocidal. This at least plausible, plausible genocidal intent can also be deduced from the pattern of conduct against Palestinians in Gaza. It is also, again at the very least, plausible that Israel has failed to prevent or to punish genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to genocide, attempted genocide and complicity in genocide. And it is further plausible that South Africa has an obligation to prevent genocide, including by taking all reasonable measures within its powers to influence effectively the actions of persons perpetrating and likely to commit genocide or engaging in direct or public incitement to genocide. So let me be clear. 
South Africa's obligation is motivated by the need to protect Palestinians in Gaza and their absolute rights not to be subjected to genocidal acts. Notwithstanding the incontestably serious nature of the allegations against Israel, the court should not be required before granting provisional measures to ascertain whether the existence of a genocidal intent is the only plausible inference to be drawn from the material before it. That would amount to the court making a determination on the merits. Moreover, South Africa has stressed that any motive or effort by Israel to destroy Hamas does not preclude genocidal intent by Israel towards the whole or part of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Evidence of other motives explaining its conduct as a perpetrator will not save Israel from a finding that it also possessed the requisite genocidal intent. And because of a fundamental feature of genocide, namely that the prohibitions on genocide and associated offenses are used cogens in nature, they are subject therefore to no exceptional qualification. They are absolute in nature, in times of war and peace, always and everywhere. Furthermore, the fact that the alleged acts may also be characterized as crimes other than genocide should not exclude the plausible inference of the existence of genocidal intent. As the UN Secretary General has stated, the prevention of genocide is intrinsically connected to preventing crimes against humanity and war crimes, as these crimes tend to occur concurrently in the same situation rather than as isolated events. Consequently, he said, initiatives aimed at preventing one of the crimes will in most circumstances also cover the others. And as also set out in the ILC articles on state responsibility, the wrongful act of genocide is generally made up of a series of acts which are themselves internationally wrongful. Madam President, honorable members of the court, South Africa's claims thus concern in the first place its own obligations as a state party to the Genocide Convention to act to prevent and punish genocide. In the application, South Africa has stressed that it is acutely aware of its own obligation as a state party to the Convention to prevent genocide. Indeed, this court has recognized the universal character both of the condemnation of genocide and of the cooperation required in order to liberate mankind from such an odious scourge as the prohibition of genocide is assuredly a peremptory norm of international law or use cogens, it is crucial that states pursue their interest under the convention in ensuring acts of genocide are prevented. Additionally, due to the special characteristics of the genocide convention, the respondent state owes this duty not only to the Palestinian people, but to all states parties to the genocide convention, including South Africa. This has been emphasized repeatedly by this court and most recently in the Gambia case, where the court held, and I quote, all the state's parties to the Genocide Convention have a common interest to ensure that acts of genocide are prevented and that if they occur, their authors do not enjoy impunity. That common interest, said the court, implies that the obligations in question are owed by any state party to all the other state's parties to the convention. Similarly, the court has reiterated that in such a convention, the contracting states do not have any interests of their own. They merely have one and all a common interest, namely the accomplishment of those high purposes, which are the raison d'etre of the convention. Accordingly, any state party to the genocide convention and not only a specially affected state may invoke the responsibility of another state party with a view to ascertaining the alleged failure to comply with its obligations, ergo omnes partes, and to bring that failure to an end. That means that South Africa is asserting both a collective and an individual right. It is thus beyond doubt that South Africa is entitled to invoke the responsibility of Israel under the Genocide Convention through South Africa's interest in the common interest, and as a state party to the Genocide Convention itself, it is entitled to safeguard compliance with that instrument. As has been explained, the events unfolding in Gaza at the hands of the Israeli forces are frighteningly unprecedented. Yet what this court is being asked to do in these proceedings 
interdicting genocidal acts on an interim basis is sadly by no means novel. In relation to genocide, the court has indicated provisional measures in analogous circumstances to these in the Gambia case, where as here, the state sought provisional measures on the basis of the Urga Omnes right that the genocide convention be complied with. Also in respect of genocide, the court did the same in the Bosnia and Ukraine cases. And most recently, this court further accepted the Urga Omnes character of parties' rights in relation to the torture convention. So South Africa respectfully contends that in this case, the rights of the Palestinians in Gaza are no less worthy of this court's considerable protective power under Article 41 to issue provisional measures. This court cannot but find, as it did in the Gambia case, where this court held that there is a correlation between the rights of members of groups protected under the Genocide Convention, the obligations incumbent on states' parties thereto, and the right of any state party to seek compliance therewith by another state party. South Africa's request therefore complies with Article 41 of this court statute and engages the power of this court to, prever, to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. South Africa requests this court to discharge that critical protective power. And South Africa does so by virtue of its own clear right and solemn obligations held towards the international community as a whole. For the court to indicate one or more provisional measures, there must also be a link between the rights, the protection of which is sought, and the provisional measure being requested. Such a link manifestly exists, we say, between the rights claimed by South Africa in its application and the provisional measures requested, which are directly linked to the rights which form the subject matter of the dispute. The provisional measures sought therefore ensure the protection of rights which might ultimately form the basis of a judgment in the exercise of the court's jurisdiction in due course. The rights at stake in these proceedings are certainly at least plausible, grounded in a possible interpretation of the Convention, and as the Convention imposes on parties the obligation to prevent and punish genocide under Article 1, and in doing so, intends to protect groups and parts of groups from genocide. The Convention was designed to protect both states, parties, and human groups. When acts in breach of the Convention are perpetrated, it is the fundamental rights of people and the relevant group that are violated. Those fundamental rights of Palestinians in Gaza would be the subject of any judgment by this Court on the merits. Madam President, members of the Court, to find otherwise would not only be to treat Palestinians differently as less worthy of protection than others, it would also be for the court to unduly limit its own competence, to turn its back upon its extensive prior jurisprudence, and to close its eyes to the breach of the rights which lie at the heart of the Convention, and which breaches are taking place in Gaza right now as I close. Madam President, I ask you now to call Ms. Negrali KC to the podium, who will address you on a risk of further genocidal acts the risk of irreparable harm and urgency, and I thank you for your attention. I thank Professor Duplessis, and I now invite Ms. Uh, Glini Negrali to take the floor. You have the floor, Madam. Madam La Présidente. Madam President, members of the court, it is a great honour for me to appear before the court once again. It is also both a privilege and a weighty responsibility for me to represent South Africa in this case of such severe gravity. It is my task to examine the urgency and the risk of irreparable harm to the rights claimed the final two conditions to be met for the court to indicate provisional measures. Before that, I should like to address South Africa's sincere apologies to the Francophone members of the court for not having made any of its submissions in French. 
South Africa would ask you not to regard this as a lack of courtesy on its part. If you will allow, I shall now continue my pleadings in English. Madam President, members of the court, there is an urgent need for provisional measures to protect Palestinians in Gaza from the irreparable prejudice caused by Israel's violations of the Genocide Convention. The United Nations Secretary General and its chiefs describe the situation in Gaza variously as a crisis of humanity, a living hell, a bloodbath, a situation of utter deepening and unmatched horror, where an entire population is besieged and under attack, denied access to the essentials for survival on a massive scale. As the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs stated last Friday, and I quote, Gaza has become a place of death and despair. Families are sleeping in the open as temperatures plummet. Areas where civilians were told to relocate for their safety have come under relentless attack, bombardment. Medical facilities are under relentless attack. The few hospitals that are partially functional are overwhelmed with trauma cases, critically short of all supplies, and inundated by desperate people seeking safety. A public health disaster is unfolding. Infectious diseases are spreading in overcrowded shelters as sewers spill over. Some 180 women are giving birth daily amidst this chaos. People are facing the highest levels of food insecurity ever recorded. Famine is around the corner. For children in particular, the last 12 weeks have been traumatic. No food, no water, no school, nothing but the terrifying sounds of war day in and day out. Gaza has simply become uninhabitable. Its people are witnessing daily threats to their very existence while the world watches on." End quote. The court has heard of the horrific death toll and of the more than 7,000 Palestinian men, women and children reported missing, presumed dead or dying slow, excruciating deaths trapped under the rubble. Reports of field executions and torture and ill treatment are mounting as are images of decomposing bodies of Palestinian men, women and children left unburied where they were killed, some being picked upon by animals. It is becoming ever clearer that huge swathes of Gaza, entire towns, villages, refugee camps, are being wiped from the map. As you have heard, but it bears repeating, according to the World Food Programme, four out of five people in the world in famine or a catastrophic type of hunger are in Gaza right now. Indeed, experts warn that deaths from starvation and disease risk significantly outstripping deaths from bombings. The daily statistics stand as clear evidence of the urgency and of the irreparable prejudice. On the basis of the current figures, on average, 247 Palestinians are being killed and are at risk of being killed each day, many of them literally blown to pieces. They include 48 mothers each day, two every hour, and over 117 children each day, leading UNICEF to call Israel's actions a war on children. On current rates which so, show no sign of abating, each day, over three medics, two teachers, more than one United Nations employee, and more than one journalist will be killed, many while at work, or in what appear to be targeted attacks on their family homes or where they are sheltering. The risk of famine will increase each day. Each day, an average of 629 people will be wounded some multiple times over as they move from place to place, desperately seeking sanctuary. Each day, 
over 10 Palestinian children will have one or both legs amputated, many without anaesthetic. Each day, on current rates, an average of 3,900 Palestinian homes will be damaged or destroyed. More mass graves will be dug. More cemeteries will be bulldozed and bombed and corpses violently exhumed, denying even the dead any dignity or peace. Each day, ambulances, hospitals and medics will continue to be attacked and killed. The first responders who have spent three months without international assistance, trying to dig families out of the rubble with their bare hands, will continue to be targeted. On current figures, one will be killed almost every second day, sometimes in attacks launched against those attending the scene to rescue the wounded. Each day, yet more desperate people will be forced to relocate from where they are sheltering or will be bombed in places where they have been told to evacuate to. Entire multi-generational families will be obliterated. And yet more Palestinian children will become WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family, the terrible new acronym born out of Israel's genocidal assault on the Palestinian population in Gaza. There is an urgent need for provisional measures to prevent imminent irreparable prejudice to the rights in issue in this case. There could not be a clearer or more compelling case. In the words of the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, there must be an end to the decimation of Gaza and of its people. Turning to the court's case law, as the court has recently reaffirmed, and I quote, the condition of urgency is met when acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the court makes a final decision on the case, end quote. That is precisely the situation here. Any of those matters to which I have referred can and are occurring at any moment. United Nations Security Council resolutions demanding quote, the immediate, safe, unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance at scale throughout Gaza and full, rapid, safe and unhindered humanitarian access, end quote, remain unimplemented. United Nations General Assembly resolutions calling for a humanitarian ceasefire have been ignored. The situation could not be more urgent. Since these proceedings were initiated, on the 29th of December 2023 alone, an estimated over 1,703 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza and over 3,252 injured. As to the criterion of irreparable prejudice, for decades now, the court has repeatedly found it to be satisfied in situations where serious risks arise to human life or to other fundamental rights. In the cases of Georgia, Russia, and Armenia, Azerbaijan, the court ordered provisional measures, having found a serious risk of irreparable prejudice where hundreds of thousands of people had been forced from their homes. In ordering provisional measures in the latter case, the court noted the context of, I quote, the long-standing exposure of the population to a situation of vulnerability including hindrances to the importation of essential goods, causing shortages of food, medicine, and other life-saving medical supplies." End quote. In Gaza, as you have heard, nearly two million people, over 85% of the population, have been repeatedly forced to flee their homes and shelters, not just once or twice, but some three, four, or more times over, into shrinking slivers of land where they continue to be bombed and killed. This is a population that Israel had already made vulnerable through, 13, through 16 years of military blockade and crippling de-development. Today, Israel's hindrances to the import of food and essential items have brought Gaza to the brink of famine. 
with adults, mothers, fathers, grandparents, regularly foregoing food for the day so that children can eat at least something. Medicine shortages and the lack of medical treatment, clean water and electricity are so great that large numbers of Palestinians are dying or are at imminent risk of dying preventable deaths. Cancer and other services have long shut down. Women are undergoing caesarean sections without anaesthetic in barely functioning hospitals described as scenes from a horror movie with many undergoing otherwise unnecessary hysterectomies in an, in an attempt to save their lives. In the Canada-Syria torture case, the court made clear that, I quote, individuals subject to torture and other acts of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment are at serious risk of irreparable prejudice. Well, Palestinians in Gaza are also at risk of such irreparable prejudice with videos of Palestinian boys and men rounded up and stripped and degraded, broadcast to the world, alongside footage of serious bodily harm and accounts of serious mental harm and humiliation. In Qatar, United Arab Emirates, the court considered provisional measures to be justified, having regard to the risk of irreparable prejudice deriving from factors such as people being forced to leave their places of residence, without the possibility of return, the psychological distress of temporary or potentially ongoing separation from their families, and the harm associated with students being prevented from taking their exams. If provisional measures were justified there, how could they not be in Gaza, where countless families have been separated, with some family members evacuating under Israeli military orders and others staying behind at extreme risk to care for the wounded, infirm, and the elderly, where husbands, fathers, and sons are being rounded up and separated from their families, taken to unknown locations for indeterminate periods of time. In the Qatar case, the court issued a provisional order where harm to approximately 150 students was an issue. In Gaza, 625,000 schoolchildren have not attended school for three months, with the United Nations Security Council expressing deep concern, I quote, that the disruption of access to education has a dramatic impact on children and that conflict has lifelong effects on their physical and mental health. Almost 90,000 Palestinian university students cannot attend at university in Gaza. Over 60% of schools, almost all universities, and countless bookshops and libraries have been damaged or destroyed, and hundreds of teachers and academics have been killed, including deans of universities and leading Palestinian scholars, obliterating the very prospects for the future education of Gaza's children and young people. Notably, the court has found provisional measures to be justified in all three cases where they were previously sought in relation to violations of the Genocide Convention. It did so in Bosnia and Serbia in 1993, finding on the basis of evidence that was certainly no more compelling than that presently before the court, that it was sufficient to determine that there was, and I quote, a grave risk of acts of genocide being committed. The court found provisional measures to be justified in the Gambia-Myanmar case on the basis of a risk of irreparable prejudice to the Rohingya, subject to, quote, mass killings as well as beatings, the destruction of villages and homes, denial of access to food, shelter, and other essentials of life. More recently, in indicating provisional measures in Ukraine-Russia, the court considered that Russia's military activities had, quote, resulted in numerous civilian deaths and injuries and caused significant material damage, including the destruction of buildings and infrastructure, end quote, giving rise to a risk of irreparable prejudice. The court had regard to the fact that, quote, attacks are ongoing and are creating increasingly difficult living conditions for the civilian population, end quote, which it considered to be 
extremely vulnerable. The court also considered the fact that, I quote again, many persons have no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines or heating, and that many were attempting to flee under extremely insecure conditions. This is occurring in Gaza on a much more intensive scale to a besieged, trapped, terrified population that has nowhere safe to go. Lest the contrary be suggested, it is clear from Ukraine-Russia that the fact that the urgent risk of irreparable harm arises in a situation of armed conflict does not undermine, much less preclude, a request for provisional measures. That's also clear from the court's other judgments. So in the case of armed activities on the territory of the Congo, for example, the court ordered provisional measures based on its finding that, quote, persons, assets, and resources present on the territory of the Congo, particularly in the area of conflict, remain extremely vulnerable, and that there was a serious risk that rights at issue in the case may suffer irreparable prejudice, end quote. Similarly, in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, the court indicated provisional measures in part on the basis that the presence of troops in the disputed territory gave rise, I quote, to a real and present risk of incidents liable to cause irremediable harm in the form of bodily injury or death, end quote. In relation to the Genocide Convention in particular, the court recalled in Gambia, Myanmar, that, quote, states' parties expressly confirmed their willingness to consider genocide as a crime under international law, which they must prevent and punish independently of the context of peace or of war in which it takes place, end quote. More recently, in the case of Guyana, Venezuela, the court considered that the serious risk of Venezuela, quote, acquiring and exercising control and administration of the territory in dispute, end quote, gave rise to a risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights asserted in the case. Similar factors are an issue here, having regard to the territorial ambitions and settlement plans and the relationship of those factors to the very survival of Palestinians in Gaza as such. Similarly, any scaling up by Israel of access of humanitarian relief to Gaza in response to these proceedings or otherwise would be no answer to South Africa's request for provisional measures. In the case of Iran, United States, the court found a risk of irreparable harm from the exposure of in individuals to danger to health and life caused by restrictions placed on medicines and medical devices, foodstuffs, and other goods required for humanitarian needs. That was notwithstanding the assurances offered by the United States for it to expedite the consideration of humanitarian issues and notwithstanding the fact that essentials were in any event exempt from the United, Nation, the United States sanctions. The court considered that the assurances were, I quote, not adequate to address fully the humanitarian and safety con concerns raised, and that there remained a risk that measures adopted by un the United States may entail irreparable consequences. In Armenia, Azerbaijan, unilateral undertakings to alleviate restrictions alongside the full resumption of humanitarian and commercial deliveries did not defeat requests for the indication of provisional measures. The court was clear that while contributing, quote, towards mitigating the imminent risk of irreparable prejudice resulting from the military operation, those developments did not remove the risk entirely. Indeed, in Georgia, Russia, the court made clear that it considers a serious risk to subsist where, quote, the situation is unstable and could rapidly change. The court considered, quote, given the ongoing tension 
and the absence of an overall settlement to the conflict in this region, populations also remain vulnerable." End quote. Israel continues to deny that it is responsible for the humanitarian crisis it, it has created, even as Gaza starves. The aid it has belatedly begun to allow in is wholly inadequate and does not come anywhere close to the average 500 trucks being permitted daily before October, the, uh, before October 2023, even under the blockade. Any unilateral undertakings Israel might seek to give about future aid would not remove the risk of irreparable prejudice, not least considering Israel's past and current conduct towards the Palestinian people, including the 16 years of brutal siege on Gaza. In any event, as the United Nations Secretary General has made absolutely clear, it is a mistake to measure, a quote, the effectiveness of the humanitarian operation in Gaza based on the number of trucks allowed in. As he stressed, I quote, the real problem is that the way Israel is conducting this offensive means that the conditions for the effective delivery of humanitarian aid no longer exist. That would require security, staff who can work in safety, logistical capacity, and the resumption of commercial activity. It requires electricity and steady communications. All of these remain absent." End quote. Indeed, only shortly after Israel opened the Karem Shalom crossing to goods in late December 2023, it was struck in a drone attack, killing five Palestinians and leading to another temporary closure. Nowhere and nobody is safe. As the United Nations Secret Secretary General and all its chiefs have made clear, without a halt to Israel's military operations, crossings, aid convoys and humanitarian workers, like everyone and everything else in Gaza, remain at imminent risk of further irreparable prejudice. An unprecedented 148 United Nations staff have been killed to date. Without a halt to Israel's military activity in Gaza, there will be no end to the extreme situation facing Palestinian civilians. Madam President, members of the court, if the indication of provisional measures was justified on the facts in those cases I have cited, how could it not be here? in a situation of much greater severity, where the imminent risk of re irreparable harm is so much greater. How could they not be justified in a situation that humanitarian veterans from crises spent spanning as far back as the killing fields of Cambodia, people who, in the words of the United Nations Secretary General, have seen everything, if they say it is so utterly unprecedented that they are out of words to describe it. It would be a complete departure from the long and established line of jurisprudence that this court has firmly established and recently reconfirmed for the court not to order provisional measures in this case. The imminent risk of death, harm and destruction that Palestinians in Gaza face today and that they risk every day during the pendency of these proceedings, on any view justifies, indeed compels, the indication of provisional measures. Some might say that the very reputation of international law, its ability and willingness to bind and to protect all people equally, hangs in the balance. But the Genocide Convention is about much more than legal precedent. It is also fundamentally about the confirmation and endorsement of elementary principles of morality. The court recalled the 1946 General Assembly Resolution on the crime of genocide, which made clear that, I quote, genocide is a denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, as homicide is the denial of the right to live of individual human beings. 
Such denial of the right of existence shocks the conscience of mankind, results in great losses to humanity in the form of cultural and other contributions represented by these human groups, and is contrary to moral law and to the spirit and aims of the United Nations." End quote. Notwithstanding the Genocide Convention's recognition of the need to rid the world of the odious scourge of genocide, the international community has repeatedly failed. It failed the people of Rwanda, it had failed the Bosnian people and the Rohingya, prompting this court to take action. It failed again by ignoring the early warnings of the grave risk of genocide to the Palestinian people, sounded by international experts since 19th of October of last year. The international community continues to fail the Palestinian people, despite the overt, dehumanizing, genocidal rhetoric by Israeli governmental and military officials matched by the Israeli army's <coughs> actions on the ground. Despite the horror of the genocide against the Palestinian people being live streamed from Gaza to our mobile phones, computers, and television screens, the first genocide in history where its victims are broadcasting their own destruction in real time in the desperate, so far vain hope that the world might do something. Gaza represents nothing short of a moral failure, as described by the universe, usually circumspect International Committee of the Red Cross. As underscored by United Nations chiefs, that failure has, I quote, repercussions not just for the people of Gaza, but for the generations to come who will never forget these over 90 days of hell and assaults on the most basic precepts of humanity. As stated by a United Nations spokesperson in Gaza last week, at the site of a hospital clearly marked with the symbol of the Red Crescent, where five Palestinians, including a five-day-old baby, had just been killed. The world should be absolutely horrified. The world should be absolutely outraged. There is no safe space in Gaza, and the world should be ashamed. Madam President, members of the court, in conclusion, I share with you two photographs. The first is of a whiteboard at a hospital in northern Gaza, one of the many Palestinian hospitals targeted, besieged, and bombed by Israel over the course of the past three brutal months. The whiteboard is wiped clean of no longer possible surgical cases, leaving only a handwritten message by a Médecins Sans Frontières doctor, which reads, we did what we could, remember us. The second photograph is of the same whiteboard after an Israeli strike on the hospital on the 21st of November that killed the author of the message, Dr. Mahmoud Abu Nujela, along with two of his colleagues. Just over a month later, in a powerful sermon, delivered from a church in Bethlehem on Christmas Day, the same day Israel had killed 250 Palestinians, including at least 86 people, many from the same family, massacred in a single strike on Magazi refugee camp. Palestinian pastor Munzer Ishak addressed his congregation and the world, and he said, and I quote, Gaza as we know it no longer exists. This is an annihilation. This is a genocide. We will rise. We will stand up again from the midst of destruction as we have always done as Palestinians, though this is by far maybe the biggest blow we have received. But he said, no apologies will be accepted after the genocide. What has been done has been done. I want you to look in the mirror and ask, where was I when Gaza was going through a genocide? South Africa is here before this court in the Peace Palace. It has done what it could. It is doing what it can 
by initiating these proceedings, by seeking interim measures against itself as well as against Israel. South Africa now respectfully and humbly calls on this honourable court to do what is in its power to do, to indicate the provisional measures that are so urgently required to prevent further irreparable harm to the Palestinian people in Gaza, whose hopes, including for their very survival, are now vested in this court. Madame la Madam President, members of the court, I should like to thank you for your kind attention. I ask that you call Professor Lowe KC to the podium now to describe the provisional measures sought by South Africa on behalf of the Palestinian people. I thank Ms. Negralik and I now invite Professor Von Lowe to address the court. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, members of the court, it's a privilege to appear before you and an honour to do so on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. This case is brought under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, which entitles any contracting party to the Convention to submit to the court disputes relating to the interpretation, application or fulfilment of the Convention. The court does not at this stage have to determine whether or not Israel has or has not acted contrary to its obligations under the Genocide Convention. That can only be done at the merits stage. It's concerned now only with the question of what provisional measures are required pending the court's final decision on the merits. The court's jurisprudence points to five requirements for the ordering of provisional measures. The first is that there should be prima facie jurisdiction, and that was addressed by Professor Dugard. The second is that there should be a link between the measures requested and the rights underlying the main claim. This requirement is plainly satisfied. The measures request an order that Israel does not violate the very rights secured by the Genocide Convention as set out in South Africa's application. The third is the plausibility of the rights that are claimed. Professor Duplessis explained that this is clearly satisfied. The rights claimed are the very core of the Convention, notably the right not to be killed or seriously harmed and the right of the group not to be physically destroyed. Fourth and fifth, there must be a risk of irreparable prejudice capable of arising prior to the final determination of the dispute, and there must be urgency. Ms. Negrawley addressed those points. Israel has, for over three months, been mounting a continuous siege and bombardment of Gaza of a ferocity and duration that can only be seen as an attempt to destroy Gaza and its citizens. And it is publicly asserting that it will continue to do so. You are aware of the scale of the death and the scale of the destruction and it is continuing at this very minute. The court has said that, quote, a state's obligation to prevent genocide and the corresponding duty to act arise at the instant that the state learns of, or should normally have learned of, the existence of a serious risk that genocide will be committed. From that moment onwards, if a state has available to it means likely to have a deterrent effect, 
on those suspected of preparing genocide or reasonably suspected of harboring specific intent. It is under a duty to make such use of those means as the circumstances permit." End quote. And that is what South Africa has done by making this application. In cases such as La Grande, Avena, Jadav, this court has exercised its power to order provisional measures, having regard to the impact not only of provisional measures on the state's parties to a case, but also to the impact on the individuals directly affected and their rights. It has issued orders to restrain states from killing individuals in a manner alleged to violate international law. And that is what South Africa is requesting after more than 23,000 individuals have already been killed in the siege and bombardment of Gaza, the overwhelming majority of them innocent men, women, and children. The court also issues orders to safeguard the integrity of its proceedings and the efficacy of its final ruling. In the Bosnia genocide case, for example, you ordered that the parties, quote, not take any action and ensure that no action is taken, which may aggravate or extend the existing dispute over the prevention or punishment of the crime of genocide, or render it more difficult of solution, end quote. Without such non-aggravation orders, there is a real risk that a respondent will rush to complete its unlawful conduct before the court's final ruling, thus rendering the ruling and the court an irrelevance. Well, South Africa has kept its application in this case within the scope of the convention. First, some will ask why South Africa does not seek any court order against Hamas. This case concerns Israel's actions in Gaza, which is territory that three weeks ago in Resolution 2720, the UN Security Council stressed is, quote, an integral part of the territory occupied in 1967, end quote, by Israel. As the court will understand, Hamas is not a state and cannot be a party to the Genocide Convention and cannot be a party to these proceedings. There are other bodies and processes that can address the questions of steps to be taken in respect of past atrocities and against other actors. And they are no doubt considering what they should do. But as a matter of law, under the convention, South Africa cannot request an order from this court against Hamas. Secondly, South Africa understands that not all violence constitutes genocide. Acts of ethnic cleansing, collective punishment, the targeting of civilians, attacks on hospitals and other war crimes are all unlawful but they do not always violate the Genocide Convention. Genocide requires an intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. But the fact that what Israel is doing in Gaza may also constitute war crimes or crimes against humanity is no defense and no bar to a charge of genocide. South Africa has set out its request for relief in paragraph 111 of its application and its request for provisional measures in paragraph 144. The reasoning behind the request is pragmatic. 
The first two paragraphs of the provisional measures request call for the suspension of Israel's military operations in and against Gaza. Israel's continuing occupation, uh, operation in Gaza since the 7th of October attack is the focus of this case. Minister Lamola has recalled the fact that South Africa has condemned the 7th of October attack. Israel says that Palestine and Palestinians are not its target, and that its aim is to destroy Hamas. But months of continuous bombing, flattening entire residential blocks, and cutting off food and water and electricity and communications to an entire population cannot credibly be argued to be a manhunt for members of Hamas. It is an indiscriminate attack, killing, maiming, and terrorizing the entire population of Gaza with no regard to questions of innocence or guilt, obliterating the homes and cities in which they live, and destroying any practical possibility of their return to make their homes amidst the rubble. Israel's actions both attack Palestinians in Gaza directly and also prevents humanitarian relief reaching them. Palestinians face death from continuing bombardments and shootings and death from starvation and disease, which is even more indiscriminate but usually slower. In recent days, the United States has said again that far too many civilians are being killed. And the UN Secretary General and the UN Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs and the Commissioner General of the UN Relief and Works Agency have asserted that it is imperative to halt military operations in order to enable the effective delivery of humanitarian relief. And that is why South Africa has requested an order for the immediate suspension of Israel's military operations in and against Gaza. It is the only way to secure the humanitarian response and avoid yet more unnecessary death and destruction. There is a point to emphasize. It's no use Israel saying that it does whatever it can to minimize the deaths of innocent men, women, and children. The use of 2,000 pound bunker busting bombs and dumb bombs in residential areas and the relentless bombardment of Gaza and even of so-called safe areas to which Palestinians have been directed by Israel tell another story. But that is not the only point. It's not just a question of scale and of indiscriminate killing. It's also a question of intention. If any military operation, no matter how carefully it's carried out, is carried out pursuant to an intention to destroy a people in whole or in part, it violates the, gen the Genocide Convention, and it must stop. And that is why all military operations capable of violating the Genocide Convention must cease. The third request is for an order that both Israel and South Africa, in accordance with their obligations under the Genocide Convention in relation to the Palestinian people, take all reasonable measures to prevent genocide. The fourth and fifth measures then spell out these general obligations in terms of the specific instances of offenses listed in Articles 1, uh, 2, and 3 of the Convention. The sixth requested measure addresses the fact that, aside from its own acts, 
the government of Israel is legally bound to prevent and punish others who engage in or incite or actively support conduct that violates the Genocide Convention. Until the reported intervention of the Attorney General 36 hours ago, Israeli authorities appear to have done practically nothing to stop the flow of genocidal rhetoric, including statements emanating from the ranks of public officials. Indeed, the toleration, even normalization of such incitement has become a matter of concern within Israel itself. And that is why this measure is sought. This case is important. Lives are at stake. Israel's credibility and reputation are at stake. Yet evidence that could determine whether or not particular acts violate the Genocide Convention is being lost or destroyed, while fact finders and foreign journalists are unable to report freely from Gaza. Hence the seventh request, which is for an order directing the preservation of evidence. And finally, South Africa asks that the court requires specific reports from Israel on what it is doing to implement the order. General assurances are not enough. Reports published via the court are an essential element of accountability. I should address the question of self-defense. In its advisory opinion in the Wall case, the court noted that the threat that Israel had argued justified the construction of the wall was not imputable to a foreign state, but emanated from territory, the occupied Palestinian territory, over which Israel itself exercises control. For those reasons, the court decided, as a matter of international law, the right of self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter, the UN Charter, had no relevance in such circumstances. 20 days ago, the Security Council affirmed yet again that Gaza is occupied territory. Though Israel refers to a complete withdrawal from Gaza, it has retained control over Gaza over access by land and sea and air, and over key governmental functions and supplies of water and electricity. The tightness of its grip may have varied, but no one can doubt the continuous reality of Israel's grip on Gaza. The court's legal holding from 2004 holds good, and a similar point is to be made here. What Israel is doing in Gaza, it is doing in territory under its own control. Its actions are enforcing its occupation. The law on self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter has no application. But that is not the main point. The main point is much simpler. It is that no matter how monstrous or appalling an attack or provocation, genocide is never a permitted response. Every use of force, whether used in self-defense or in enforcing an occupation or in policing operations or otherwise, must stay within the limits set by international law, including the explicit duty in Article 1 of the Convention to prevent genocide. South Africa believes that the publicly available evidence of the scale of the destruction resulting from the bombardment of Gaza and the deliberate restriction of food, water, medicines and electricity available to the population of Gaza 
demonstrates that the government of Israel, not Jewish people or Israeli citizens, the government of Israel and its military is intent on destroying the Palestinians in Gaza as a group and is doing nothing to prevent or punish the actions of others who support that aim. And I repeat, the point is not simply that Israel is acting disproportionately. The point is that the prohibition on genocide is an absolute, a peremptory rule of law. Nothing can ever justify genocide. No matter what some individuals within the group of Palestinians in Gaza may have done, and no matter how great the threat to Israeli citizens might be, genocidal attacks on the whole of Gaza and the whole of its population with the intent of destroying them cannot be justified. And no exception can be made in a provisional measures order to allow a state to engage in actions that are capable of violating its obligations under the Genocide Convention. It is unthinkable that a court would ever do such a thing. That is the simple point in this case. Genocide can never be justified in any circumstances. Israel's actions will be examined closely and methodically at the merit stage when the court will want to hear what Israel has to say in its defense. What matters now is that the evidence indicates that Israel's actions have violated its obligations under the Genocide Convention, that they continue to violate them, and that Israel has asserted that it intends to continue them. Israel may say that it will comply with all of its obligations under the Genocide Convention and that orders from the court are not necessary. But in previous cases, the court has held that such unilateral statements do not remove the risk of irreparable prejudice or obviate the need for a court order. In this case, one reason for doubting the efficacy of any such unilateral undertaking is Israel's apparent inability to see that it has done anything wrong in grinding Gaza and its people into the dust. Another reason is that a departure from or reinterpretation of any unilateral undertaking by Israel may lead to consequences so appalling that the risk simply cannot be taken. But there is a third reason. As was noted during the submissions to this court in the case concerning the reservations to the Genocide Convention in 1951, Quote, the obligation to submit disputes concerning the interpretation or execution of the convention to the International Court of Justice was regarded as one of the prime guarantees of the due fulfillment of the basic obligation to prevent and punish the crime of genocide, end quote. The role of the court which unusually extends not only to the interpretation and application of the Convention, but also to its fulfillment, is pivotal. In addition to their substantive obligations under the Convention, it is vitally important that states respect the court and their procedural obligations. This is not a moment for the court to sit back and be silent. It's necessary that it assert its authority and itself order compliance with the obligations under the Genocide Convention. Indeed, it's hard to think of a case in recent history which has been so important for the future of international law and of this court. Madam President, members of the court, that concludes my submission. I thank you for your attention. And unless I can help you further, I would ask that you call on South Africa's agent to read out the request for relief.
I thank Professor Lowe, and I now invite the agent of South Africa, His Excellency, Mr. Wusumuzi Madonsela, to address the court. You have the floor, Excellency. Madam President, it remains my honor to read to your excellencies the provisional measures that South Africa requests from the court. You have heard the reasons set out which justify the measures being sought. To sum up, the indication of provisional measures is, we recognize, without prejudice to the merits of the underlying claim. Yet, the evidence at this stage indicates grave violence and genocidal acts against the Palestinians in Gaza, in flagrant contravention of the Genocide Convention and in breach of their rights. South Africa has come to this court to prevent genocide and to do so in the discharge of the international obligation that rests on South Africa and all other states under the convention. The consequences of not indicating clear and particularized specific provisional measures and not taking steps to intervene while Israel disregards its international obligations before our eyes would, we fear, be very grave indeed for the Palestinians in Gaza who remain at real risk of further genocidal acts, for the integrity of the Convention, for the rights of South Africa, and for the reputation of this court, which is equipped with and must exercise its powers to afford an effective realization of the rights under the Convention. That means we respectfully submit, indicating the provisional measures being sought by South Africa, as well as any others in addition which the court might deem appropriate justice and equal respect for the rights of Palestinians points overwhelmingly in favor of these critically required provisional measures. Madam President, I now proceed to read the measures requested by South Africa. On the basis of the facts set forth above, South Africa as a state party to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide respectfully request the court as a matter of extreme agency, pending the court's determination of this case on the merits to indicate the following provisional measures in relation to the Palestinian people as a group protected by the Genocide Convention. These measures are directly linked to the rights that form the subject matter of South Africa's disputes with Israel. One, the State of Israel shall, shall immediately suspend its military operations in and against Gaza. Two, the State of Israel shall ensure that any military or irregular armed units which may be directed, supported, or influenced by it, as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control, direction, or influence, take no steps in furtherance of the military operations referred to in point one above. Three, the Republic of South Africa and the State of Israel shall each, in accordance with their obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, in relation to the Palestinian people, take all reasonable measures within their power to prevent genocide. Four, the State of Israel shall, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, in relation to the Palestinian people as a group protected by the Convention, 
on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide, desists from the commission of any and all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention. In particular, A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Five, the State of Israel shall, pursuant to point four, paragraph C above, in relation to Palestinians, desist from and take all measures within its power, including the rescinding of relevant orders, of restrictions and or prohibitions to prevent A, the expulsion and forced displacement from their homes, B, the deprivation of access to adequate food and water, access to humanitarian assistance, including access to adequate fuel, shelter, clothes, hygiene and sanitation the medical supplies and assistance, and C, the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza. Number six, the State of Israel shall, in relation to Palestinians, ensure that its military, as well as any irregular armed units or individuals which may be directed, supported, or otherwise influenced by it, and any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control, direction or influence, do not commit any acts described in four and five above, or engage in direct and public incitement to commit genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, or complicity in genocide. And insofar as they do engage therein, that steps are taken towards their punishment pursuant to Articles 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Number seven, the State of Israel shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. To that end, the states of Israel shall not act to deny or otherwise restrict access by fact-finding missions, international mandates, and other bodies to Gaza to assist in ensuring the preservation and retention of said evidence. Number eight, the state of Israel shall submit a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one week, as from the date of this order, and thereafter at such regular intervals as the court shall order, until a final decision on the case is rendered by the court, and that such reports shall be punished by, published by the court, I beg your pardon. Number nine, the State of Israel shall refrain from any action and shall ensure that no action is taken which might aggravate or extend the dispute before the court or make it more difficult to resolve. Thank you, Madam President and distinguished members of the court. That concludes South Africa's address. Thank you. I thank the agent of South Africa whose statement brings to an end the single round of oral argument of South Africa, as well as this morning's sitting. The court will meet again tomorrow, 12 January, 2024, at 10 a.m., to hear the single round of oral argument of Israel. The sitting is adjourned.